Okay, excellent. That's done. Okay. Please. I'd wondered if it got there. Okay, so thank you um, for those kind words and for the invitation to uh, be here today. I'll just share my screen now um, and we'll start the PowerPoint itself. Um, make sure the show starts. Excellent. So there we go. So as I say, thank you, particularly for the kind words about uh, being well known in the field of diplomatic. I'm not sure that's necessarily the case yet. Um, the book coming up next year is the first dedicated comparative one, certainly where I work on anything other than Anglo-Saxon diplomatic. So uh, I approach this paper with some trepidation given the expertise in the virtual room, but I do appreciate the opportunity. Um, as mentioned there, this talk is part of a wider project that was first funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council here in the United Kingdom for two years, and now is funneling into the book that's coming out in February. And I'll be presenting basically one of the chapters, but I'd be happy to talk about other elements. The project and the book, and this is now the cover, which we just recently got through, um, consists of five case studies, as you can see from the contents there from the first proofs. Um, and what they seek to do is look at the institutional context of forgery. So ask why did people forge, where, when, what consequences, particularly looking at the 10th and the 11th centuries. Um, and this talk is coming from that fourth chapter on forging exemption, Fleury from Abbo to William. Uh, but as I say, I'd be happy to talk about other elements as well. And the key issue here um, for forgery at Fleury, but also in many other centers in the 11th century, is this subject of monastic exemption. And this is something that we know thanks to books such as this by Cowdery, or this, the fine uh, contribution by Falkenstein, and finally, most recently, Kristen Rennie's um, very helpful edition um, to the literature, um, is something we think of as being above all really uh, an 11th century phenomenon in terms of it uh, becoming more formalized, that we know this is a key moment in the development of exemption and concepts of exemption. Um, it also goes hand in hand with forging exemption, which is what we will be looking at today. We can see parallel developments in canon law in things like the collection in 74 titles as discussed by Christoph Rolker. As mentioned though, I'll be approaching the subject through the diplomatic corpus and particularly through the Fleury corpus. The importance of this has long been appreciated. Le Marinier wrote about the Fleury forgeries here, but their specific role is, I think, still somewhat misunderstood and I hope to throw further light on it. Just for the benefit of the few in the room who have not been spending all of their waking and sleeping hours worrying about exemption recently. Obviously, we're thinking of this as the ecclesiastical counterpart of immunity, a concept that develops in the sixth century, but um, at least is there, originally being expressed primarily in Episcopal charters for monasteries, but increasingly becomes the business of popes. And we already see this happening under Gregory the Great and his register. We get lots of uh, evidence of some of these tensions between monasteries and their diocesan bishops. But the next real flashpoint where we really see a lot of discussion of this is the late 10th and 11th centuries. And France is really at the forefront of developments here. This is obviously a period where in France itself, royal power is comparatively weak, at least in certain views, still atrophying. Um, and this offers new opportunities for Episcopal domination. One thinks of the kind of work of Florian, uh, Florian Mazel on the definition of uh, diocese in this period. Um, it also, though, offers new opportunities, and I think it's at least as important, if not more so, for monks to remove themselves. Uh, and I suspect a lot of the more novelty isn't so much coming from Episcopal demands as from uh, monastic claims to freedom um, as well. So we've got this kind of twofold process of uh, bishops trying to dominate more firmly and monks also seeing opportunities to escape more fully. And few places exemplify these trends better than Fleury, and it's often discussed in this context. And few figures arguably are more important here than Abbo, its famous abbot from 987 to 1004. And so we're thinking obviously of Fleury, again, these slides are originally intended for an Anglophone audience, but obviously we're thinking of this being a hugely important and wealthy abbey um, on, in the Loire Valley, just upstream from the local diocesan bishop at Orléans. And that's the main 
problem here because of course Fleury is a natural point of interest for the local diocesan bishops. Theodolf, um, the famous bishop, had also been abbot of Fleury and later bishops uh, often seem to have angled for a similar kind of control. The situation is not helped here by political changes and that famous regime change as we move from the late Carolingians to the Capetians. Because although Fleury has been in the royal, um, in the traditional Capetian heartlands um, around um, uh, Orléans oh, itself. Wow. Oh, sorry, that's just my speaker powering off. Um, uh, although it lay within those domains, it was not a traditional Robertian center. In fact, it was traditionally a royal monastery with close links to the late Carolingians. It, Hugh the Great, the father of Hugh Capet, was involved in the center's reform, and this has been seen as an effort to bring it within the Robertian fold. Uh, but if so, it was at best partially successful and arguably not very successful at all. So um, all of the late Carolingian rulers issue immunities for Fleury and the miracles of uh, St. Benedict mention that one of the things that the local diocesan bishop Arnulf is frustrated and annoyed about is that the monks only defer to um, uh, the authority of the kings and not to the local bishop. By contrast, the local bishop in the form of Arnulf of Orléans was one of the closest allies of the early Capetians. So Hugh Capet famously entrusts his main competitor for the throne, Charles, um, Charles of Lorraine, to um, Arnulf as his jailer. Um, he also leads the charge at the Synod of Saint Basil de Versi, um, where Hugh is looking to depose the Archbishop of Rams, and there Arnulf is one of his main backers. Other centers in this period had indeed fallen under Episcopal oversight. So Misi, just outside Orléans, um, was now fairly firmly under Episcopal control. And it's quite clear that Arnulf had similar ambitions for Orléans. So there's already signs of strain here in the mid to later 980s. Um, Imoin, who um, uh, writes of these relations, talks about Arnulf as a good bishop, but who has it out for the monks because they only defer to the late Carolingian kings. He also recounts a famous tale of how um, uh, Arnulf had his men try to prevent the monks from uh, uh, collecting um, goods from their vineyards in the outskirts of Orléans. Um, and in response, they're forced to take out their reliquary. And they claim, in fact, it's uh, relics of two of their more minor saints, but they claim it's the relics of St. Benedict out to def defend his grapes. Um, and faced by this superior spiritual firepower, Arnulf backs down. But the point is, he's clearly wherever possible, making life difficult for the monks. And the situation simply gets worse in the 990s then when the Capetians become kings themselves and during Abbo's abbacy. The very first report of his abbacy um, by his biographer, the same Imoin, is of Abbo and his men being attacked by Arnulf while en route to Saint Martin in Tours, which uh, would naturally take you by or through Orléans itself. More light is thrown on these difficulties by one of the few original charters to survive from the center um, from these years, because of course, as many of you will know, the Fleury archive, particularly of the charters, is, uh, uh, has huge, huge losses uh, from the dispersal of the archives in the uh, wars of religion. Um, but this one of our few survivors, the earliest survivor we have, um, reveals a fraught compromise over rights at Yevre la Ville between Arnulf the Castellan, who is uh, the nephew of Bishop Arnulf, it's very confusing, they all have the same name, um, and he's claimed local income. Now, in response, the monks appeal to uh, Hugh Capet, and formally their rights are acknowledged, but in practice, Arnulf is allowed to continue receiving dues um, until his uncle, for the rest of his uncle's lifetime, uh, in, um, in thanks for Arnulf's support that he's been providing Hugh against Otto of blois who's been a thorn in the side of the new Capetian king. Now, this is a fascinating text um, in terms of its rhetoric, it reads much more like the kinds of uh, uh, notices of transaction we see gaining popularity in these years, in the sense that it's not speaking, although it's speaking technically in the royal voice, it's very much the voice of Fleury. It describes these demands by the Castellan Arnulf as unreasonable, wrong. It claims the monk's rights were completely upheld. Uh, but of course, between the lines, it's actually quite clear that this was an awkward compromise in practical terms. All they get given is the right to those um, uh, that that rightfully belongs to them, but actually that in practice, dues will continue being paid for the foreseeable future. Um, 
It's a document that uh, Guyot Jianin has discussed um, in very good detail at a couple of points. Um, and it's clearly partly based on that rhetoric, but also on the script or recipient product. If you look here, whoever wrote this clearly is not used to those longer ascenders and descenders. There are some interesting odd archaisms, open A, things like that, all of which suggest this is someone who is more used to something like a book hand adjusting to this kind of work. And it fits nicely with, as I say, that rhetoric, which is very much uh, Fleury's perspective on matters and trying to put the best spin uh, on a very awkward compromise, sort of a rhetorical compensation for the practical loss of rights. So this is already a sign of uh, problems here. Um, at the same time, or in these same years, um, Abbo and Arnulf found themselves on the opposite sides of the major debates of the era. So famously at the Saint Basel Council, where uh, Arnulf, another Arnulf of uh, Rams is deposed, Abbo leads the papal charge trying to defend the archbishop, while Arnulf is leading the royal charge against the archbishop. So they're diametrically opposed. Um, and Abbo's clearly intervening there in part because he's afraid of unbridled episcopal power. Um, only a few years later at the Synod of Saint-Denis in 993 or 994, likewise Abbo defends the right of monks to tithes, um, uh, while Arnulf and Gerber, who became Arnulf's replacement at Rams, uh, are arguing the Episcopal side, which is that these should all be clawed back to the bishops. It's in the context of these threats and tensions that Abbo then appealed for support in the middle years of this decade. And so here we see him writing his famous Liber Apologeticus to Hugh, um, to Kings Hugh and Robert, Hugh's son Robert the Pious, who's now been crowned. Um, and he also uh, produces a canon law collection, which again, he dedicates to Hugh and Robert. Now, traditional wisdom holds that these are evidence of Abbo gaining traction. You'll read of that in Riche or in Moster. I must say that I'm very wary of such arguments because they presume that just because Abbo is writing tracts for kings, that kings are listening. Uh, and in fact, if we look at these works, they have a very narrow manuscript transmission, unique manuscripts of each work. Um, and in the case of the Apologeticus, it's a unique Fleury manuscript. The other is uniquely copied um, uh, by, um, oh, what's his name? Um, in um, uh, the Moge, I'll come back to me later. But anyway, there's a very narrow manuscript transmission and there's no real signs of large citation of these works. So. I'm very wary of the argument that suddenly Abbo is coming into his own. And indeed, when we turn to the diplomatic um, record, uh, it's, what's striking is its complete silence on these years. So Hugh conformed the monk's um, liberty um, and immunity, but Robert notably does not. Um, in fact, the only evidence we have of Robert favoring the center is a de perditum concerning Pithivier, and that probably comes from Gautzlan's abbacy. So, I think actually we'd be do well to treat Abbo as being more like Hinkmar of Rams in his later years, something of a parchment tiger. He's writing these works and these treatises precisely because I don't think he's being listened to. And they alone certainly are not evidence that he is being listened to. Framing things this way makes much better sense then of what Abbo does next, because he now turns to Rome uh, requesting papal privileges for his center. And it's important to emphasize here that there's not a strong tradition of this at Fleury. So Fleury's only received two prior uh, privileges for its sort of liberty and uh, what we might call loosely exemption um, before. Um, these are a privilege in the name of John VIII, who's a very active Pope in this respect. Rennie discusses this very well. And then one of Leo VII. And the Leo VII one is issued in 938, just after Otto's reformed the center. It shares close formulaic links with um, uh, similar bulls for uh, Cluny and Deol, and almost certainly is drafted by Otto or an associate of it. So it does not respect, re represent native Fleury tradition, if you will, although it does exist there. So it's not an obvious move necessarily for Abbo to make. All of his predecessors have looked to the kings, but of course, traditionally, the kings are not the local magnates. They are the Carolingian kings further away. So he's having to adjust to new circumstances. And it seems that he sees in these earlier privileges a kind of model for what he can do though, and a basis on which he can build. And so it's in this context that he turns to Rome. Another impetus, an important moment here may well have been a meeting with the papal legate Leo Santi Bonifacio ed Alessio, who's been involved in the conflicts over Rams and they probably met uh, in Rams itself at a council in uh, early 995. In any case, it's in 
uh, summer probably of 995 that Abbo first travels to Rome and he requests, at least Einwein tells us, a confirmation of uh, Fleury's traditional rights. But John the 15th, the Pope, refuses to do so because, according to Einwein, he doesn't do anything if he's not paid and he's basically completely useless. Um, Abbo later seems to write to Leo about the, these frustrations. I wonder if there's not more going on here. Um, given the nature of the exemption uh, 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 Abbo later receives, I wonder if he didn't ask John for rather more than any of the previous privileges had accorded Fleury, and that's where everything came undone um, in terms of this. And later, therefore, Fleury's sources are so hostile to him. In any case, fairly soon, Abbo gets to try his luck again, because he's then sent by Robert, according to Imoin, again, our nearest and best testimony here, um, back to Rome. Now, the dating of this second trip, or possibly third, um, uh, we don't need to worry about second or third, I think, for this paper today, but I can happily get into it. Uh, Riche thinks it might be a third trip. Um, but in any case, this trip, um, its dating is somewhat contested. And broadly speaking, German scholars, scholars tend to date it to 996 and Francophone scholars to 997. Uh, and the entire issue is complicated by presumptions around what Abbo is doing, particularly by the idea that Abbo may have been there to discuss Robert the Pious's second marriage to Bertha, which is an issue uh, that becomes a major problem with the Pope uh, because they are related by bonds of spiritual relation. He is being the godson to godparent to one of her children. Now, if Abbo is being sent to negotiate Robert's marriage, the trip must be from 997. And that's why I think Francophone scholarship has tended to lump for this because it tends to know the situation at the Capetian court better because Hugh is alive until late September in 996. Um, and the obvious context for these kinds of negotiations is once he's dead because he's been the person who set up Robert's first marriage. Now, I don't want to bog you down too much here and do want to get to the charters sooner rather than later, but because this presumption has become something of a sacred cow and uh, it's a, the kind of thing that exists so much in the scholarship, it's worth noting here. Um, and one of the things that I was surprised when coming to work on this um, uh, material is that despite what every and pretty much every modern book an article on the subject says from um, uh, uh, Riche to Mostert, I can find no evidence that Abbo was ever sent to negotiate Robert's marriage with the Pope. The sources, as far as I can tell, simply do not say this. Imoin says he sent to negotiate issues at Rams. Abbo on his return writes a letter to Pope Gregory V. He mentions ongoing issues at Rams and mentions how uh, King Robert's angry with him because of his intervention. Riche reads into this, as Ferdinand Lott did earlier, that he's also angry about the marriage arrangements, but the letter doesn't say anything about marriage. And in fact, the only evidence we have, and so the idea is meant to be that um, he's sent there with an agreement that he'll allow um, Arnulf back to Rams in exchange for Robert's marriage being acknowledged. Later, Gerber's letters do mention that Abbot Leo of Santi Bonifacio ed Alessio made this offer, but he doesn't say it was Abbo. And he seems to be indicating that it's new. And that letter comes later than this. In fact, the only source that suggests that Abbo ever had anything to do with Robert's second marriage is Helgo, who says he opposed it vehemently. And while we need to be very careful with Helgo, he may well be right here. So we can probably simply dispose of that entire marital politics. And as soon as we can, then the dating does probably have to come to 996, to autumn 996. And the key issue here is that Imoin says that Abbo goes to Rome and is surprised not to find the Pope there. So then goes to Spoleto to find him in Spoleto to find Gregory V there. Now, Gregory V is driven out of Rome in the summer of 996. No one would be surprised not to find him there in autumn 997. So it must be 996. It's also only autumn 996 that he's in Spoleto. In 997, he's in Northern Italy. So that almost certainly must be the moment that it comes and happens at. The reason why there's been some further uncertainty here is that the eventual exemption that he receives is dated to autumn 997. I suspect what's happened is he meets with the Pope in 996. He receives permission to draw up this document and then it is formally issued in 997. So this is a distinction between the kind of acta and data, if you will. Um, a classic example of, of, of that happening. And it may well be that Abbo never returned, that in fact, he just sent messengers to get the final bull produced. Um, so we can probably place this in 
um, autumn 996, leading to then a uh, diploma itself from 997. And this is the basically Mostert's view of this as well as uh, in terms of how it would be produced. And now we finally come to my main subject. I know it's been a fair bit of context, but I think some important background here to appreciate the finer details. So what comes of all this then is an important privilege of exemption. This is our most detailed to date for any center, any monastery. It not only secures the holdings and liberty of Fleury as previous papal documents had, but it specifically decrees that the local diocesan bishop is only to enter the monastery with the monk's express permission. The abbot is only to be judged by a full provincial synod and then is to have recourse to Rome. He's to have the power of binding and loosing within monastic walls, that distinctly Episcopal power. Abbo is to be free from any interdict that comes down on the kingdom, presumably with an eye here to Robert's marriage. His monks are to receive special rights in the case of being excommunicated and so on. What this does is at almost every level seeks to remove the abbey from the jurisdiction of the local bishop and set up the abbot, as, if, you will, if you will, as the bishop within um, cloister walls. Now, nothing like this had been seen before, even in Otto's privilege of 938. The authenticity of this document has, because of its uh, uh, wide ranging terms, sometimes been doubted, but Mostert made a strong case for its authenticity in the late 1980s in this article. Um, and I think uh, pretty much everyone has agreed with him since. Uh, he notes that there are strong similarities in its wording, in its use of sources to Abbo's own writings. Um, and he therefore concluded that it was a recipient production. The key thing to note is that since he's written, we've discovered that recipient production or at least recipient influence is in fact the norm. Hans Henning Kortum has shown that in this period for papal documents. So even if they're drawn up at the papal chancery in curial script and on papyrus, uh, lots of the materials behind them are drafted locally. So uh, this is one of those issues where pre, where scholarship before Mostert and even some after him was a bit doubtful because it seemed like a recipient product, but actually that's what we would expect and should expect. So it makes sense. And the fact that it looks like Abbo's writing should make us more confident, not less confident in its authenticity. Crucially, it's also mentioned by Imoin, and this was already noted by Ferdinand Lott, who was one of the early scholars to argue in its favor. So it must have existed in some form shortly after Abbo's death, probably by about 1005. It also then later serves as the model for uh, Alexander II's bull of 1072. Prue and Vidier wondered if it might not have been forged then as a model, but because Imoin has seen it, that, that cannot hold, as Lot already pointed out. Crucially as well, similar rights are granted to Cluny in a privilege of 998 in terms of exemption. So we can actually trace also uh, a growth in these concepts and a natural organic one within reforming circles in these years. And Odilo of Cluny is in close contact at times with Abbo and both with Emperor Otto III and Pope Gregory V. So it all falls into place here. Now, much of the same formulation as this privilege here appears in two purportedly earlier papal privileges. One in the name of Gregory IV, which is almost identical verbatim, and another in the name of Benedict VII, which draws heavily on it. Both of these are clearly forgeries and have long been known to be such. Pru and Vidier already saw through them. But the question is when and by whom? Now, Mostert in this article argued that the former of these, the Gregory IV text, text pseudo Gregory IV, was forged by Abbo in order to obtain his bull as confirmation. So after having failed once, he then forged a basis and then succeeded. And it's a very elegant argument that's been expected, accepted by everyone since, from Thomas Head to Richet to Morel to most recently uh, Rennie. The one slight cause for concern here, even immediately, however, is that the 997 privilege is not worded as a confirmation of anything and never mentions Gregory IV. And indeed, when we look, diff look more closely, more problems emerge because unfortunately, this is one of those moments where Homer nods. And there are key, three key textual variants between pseudo Gregory IV and Gregory V and the authentic Gregory V text. They're very, very close, but there's three variants. And all crucially indicate that Abbo's privilege has textual priority and must be the source of Gregory IV rather than Gregory IV being the source of the Gregory V privilege. In all cases, indeed, the Gregory V text is closer to their shared models, often the earlier bull of John VIII. So you can easily get from Abbo's 997 text 
do the Gregory the Fourth forgery, but you'd really struggle to do the reverse. And here I'll show you how and why. So this is the first variant you may have here. So it's in the opening um, uh, 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 historical excursus, um, offering us um, the, narr the narratio, um, uh, the background to the grant. And the key thing to note is on the left-hand side is pseudo Gregory the Fourth, is that here there's a lot of detail that's not in the authentic Gregory the Fifth text, and the issue is that the Gregory the Fifth text, echoing the earlier uh, John the Eighth bull, speaks of a privilege of Emperor Charles being Charles the Bald. Now our forger has realized that he cannot have Gregory the Fourth confirm a grant of Charles, um, of Emperor Charles as Charles the Bald that early, because at that point, Charles the Bald was still only king. So what he's done is he's rejigged the narratio so that he refers to an earlier privilege of Emperor Louis, Louis the Pious, and we have Louis the Pious privilege for Fleury that conveniently mentions an earlier privilege of Charlemagne. And he's then reused the formulation around the Imperator Carolus to refer to Charlemagne. So it's quite ingenious what he's done here. Uh, Mostert thought that he'd confused Charlemagne and uh, Charles the Bald. He absolutely hasn't. What he's realized is it's too early for Charles the Bald to be emperor. So he's reusing the same formulation to refer to Charlemagne. But the key point, of course, again, is that the right-hand column is basically the John VIII text. You can get from there to the left-hand column, but you can't easily reconstruct it, at least not without the John VIII text also to hand. Um, and it would seem very odd not to mention Louis the Pious if this is being based off of the Gregory the Fourth text. Why not as well? The more kings you could mention, the better. Of course, the constraint for it as the authentic text is in fact, it was only Charles the Bald who was involved with these specific rites. So this already suggests textual priority to the Gregory the Fifth text. The next one is a more nerdy small point, but not completely without significance. In their quotations from Gregory the Great's register, there's one significant variation. And that is potuerint in our left column, the rarer variant for potuerit. The key thing is the potuerit reading is the reading that is in the um, uh, manuscripts we have, the twin manuscripts we have of Gregory's register that we know Abo cites elsewhere. Whereas the potuerent reading can be found in a Fleury manuscript, but not one we know Abo to have used. So this is not decisive, but suggests again, uh, a distinction between Forger and uh, Abo potentially. The most decisive, however, is when they talk about a basial election because the Gregory V text says that the abbot, when he is to be uh, ordained and consecrated, he's to be elected by the brother on account of his uh, uh, life and his uh, honest ways and not on account of filthy lucre uh, and payment. The other one says that, but then also adds, and is to be um, consecrated um, uh, without any calumny by whichever bishop he wishes. Now, this is crucial because this extends the rights of exemption considerably further to the issue of abatial consecration. The earliest authentic privilege we have, which grants this right of external Episcopal consecration is that issued for Cluny in 998, the very next year. But the key thing is why, if Abbo is recipient producing this charter anyway, would he include it in his model, but not then include it in the resulting text? I guess we could hypothesize that Gregory V refuses Fleury and then allows Cluny the next year, but it just doesn't seem to work. It doesn't add up here. If Abbo is the author of both, then why is it in his model and not in his final text? On the other hand, it's easy to imagine why someone later might wish to insert this and we'll come back to how and why he might have wanted to do so. So the key thing is that this is actually extending Fleury's rights beyond what we think this is, which is suspicious. And it's again, very unlikely that Abbo would have used that as his model and then left out such a crucial detail he's meant to have um, inserted himself. Um, the other thing to note here is that Moster's main argument for Abbo having forged pseudo Gregory IV is that it makes so much use of Abbo's own uh, favored sources. But of course, all of that Abonian source material is simply derived from the recipient produced authentic charter. That, that doesn't count for anything. We need to prove that the concerns in the additions are also abos. And crucially that concern, external abatial consecration never appears in abos writings, even though he's very concerned about bishops and abbots and their relationships. It's not there 
in his canon law collection. It's not there in the Liber Apologeticus. It just doesn't seem to have been an issue. It seems to have been other things, particularly Episcopal access to the, cloi to the cloisters themselves seem to be really what Abba was worried about. So accepting textual priority of Abba's text then easily explains away my first problem of potentially why does the Gregory V text not mention this model? It's because in fact, it doesn't have a precise model. Um, and it's just being accurate there. The next question then is where do we place the Benedict VII bull? We can deal with this one more swiftly. Uh, this is modeled on Otto's privilege of 938, which had only been used sparingly for details in the other two, but draws then its dispositive details from the Gregory IV text. And we know it draws it from the forged Gregory IV, not the authentic Gregory V, because it contains that same phrase exactly verbatim on a basial election. And since it adds nothing else though beyond that, I would argue there's a strong a priori case for treating the Benedict VII bull as being forged in the same context, possibly by the same individual as pseudo Gregory IV, but it's a working hypothesis. I can't prove that. Now the question becomes, can we date this activity more precisely? Mostert dated the Gregory IV text um, uh, by uh, a manuscript of it, by an early manuscript of it. He drew attention to this manuscript that Prue and Vidier had not known. Um, and he dates the manuscript, well, here I'll show you an inset of it, to the first third of the 11th century in his initial article. Uh, subsequently, in his excellent um, uh, book on the Fleury Library, he seems to have rode back and said first half of the 11th century. I think he realized he may have been overreaching there a bit. Um, uh, but I'm not sure even that we can necessarily um, follow it. Uh, because that hand looked to me, looks to me, and certainly looked to me when I first looked at it, later than first half of the 11th century, and certainly later than first third. I'd be very wary of confidently placing it there. His basis for dating was this manuscript, which is in the Manuscrit Date from the Low Countries, in that volume. And this has been dated 1027 to 1039, because as a list of emperors that ends with Conrad II. That could be so. I'm wary though, I'm not convinced that that is secure dating for this manuscript either. Given that all it really proves is the base text behind it was produced in Conrad II's reign. Given also that a second hand, but a coeval hand has added Henry. So it could more naturally point towards production in Henry III's imperial reign. So that's 1046 to 1055. Um, or indeed, there's then no emperor till the late 11th century with Henry IV. So I'm not confident that on this basis, we can place that manuscript confidently in the first third of the 11th century. In any case, I would suggest that this script is um, of the uh, Gregory IV bull is if anything, slightly more advanced. So I'm wary of using that as any firm basis, but it's partly this early witness that sort of drove Mostert and convinced him, I think that Abo was the forger. So it's not clear to me that this other manuscript can do anything more than help us out with maybe mid 11th century and even then is not necessarily secure. Um, thankfully, although the Fleury uh, monuments were largely lost, the library was sufficiently large that even with the scattering, huge uh, sections of it do survive as many of you will know better than I. Um, and we're particularly helped by the large number of autograph manuscripts from this period that can help us out. So if we look at these examples, our left-hand one here is the autograph of Helgo's uh, life of Robert the Pious from about 1033. I think we can confidently say that the script is more advanced than that. It's also clearly younger than either hand of the Vita Gautzlini on your right hand side. Um, sorry if these are a bit small for you, but I can bring them up later if you want to see. Um, and one of those is probably authorial too, so we can date that to 1041 to 1044. Now those two are presentation pieces, so they're going to be more conservative in script but I would still struggle to place that earlier script if I go back to it. I'd struggle to place that uh, any earlier than the late 1040s, um, and I'd be inclined to place it in the 1060s or 1070s. We have uh, clear feet on M and N at times, we have angularity. It's clearly Caroline, but it's moving towards almost a form of proto-Gothic. Um, probably the closest I've been able to find from Fleury is um, this poem that's added uh, as a marginal addition to one of the copies of the Quaestione Grammaticales. This is generally dated around 1060. And it's quite similar, but again, I would suggest our hand is, if anything, a bit more advanced. So we can't be precise, 
Um, but I would be inclined to place that hand in the second half of the 11th century with probably a preference for the third um, quarter. So 1050 to 1075, but acknowledging a degree of leeway either way. So that doesn't actually help us much. It doesn't help us necessarily get much earlier, if any, than the Alexander II bull that confirms these texts. A further potential help is the fact that these texts were interpolated at La Réole. So these forgeries were reforged at this uh, priory. Uh, the interpolations crucially serve to extend the rights of exemption from Fleury to its dependent priories at Peresy, Sassierge, and La Réole itself. Um, and the subject of exemption of priories was a hot one in the later 11th century. Basically, um, it ends up settling being that priories don't automatically have these rights, but it's somewhat ambiguous initially as to whether or not when a mother house has these rights, they extend to all of its priories. And that's what these, um, this further forgery of the original forgeries is trying to achieve. Now it's an obvious interpolation in the Gregory IV text because we have other lines of transmission for this separate from the cartulary and Prue and Vidier were already able to highlight it as such and relegate it to the apparatus criticus. Um, what they didn't realize is that the same almost identical line in the Benedict VII text should also be considered an interpolation. And this was noted by Laurent Morel who points out that the obvious context here are conflicts of the 1070s with the local Bishop of Bazar. Again, however, this only takes us so far back. So we keep on getting stuck basically with the abbacy of the comparatively little known William of Fleury, 1067 to 1080. They suggest that these texts were well known then, and I'd be tempted to suggest that they were interpolated soon after receipt at La Réole. So given all of this, we've ended up still stuck with our old date range of between 997 and 1072, or I'd say probably between 998, that first Cluny privilege giving external abatial consecration and 1072. So I'd insist on that sort of pace uh, mustard. Two other possibilities, two main possibilities therefore emerge for um, the production of these texts. Either an earlier date, I think it can't be Abbo, given his seeming disinterest in these things and given the novelty ascribed to his own rights by Aimoin in terms of his life of Abbo. Uh, but we might place them under Gautzelan. I'll come back to this in a moment. The other option would be in the immediate run up to confirmation in 1072, so in the 1060s or 70s, around when I would date that early copy. When I was initially looking at this material, I preferred the first option. We know that Gautzelan continued to have problems with the, bishop of, with the bishops of Orléans. Andrew reports that Arnulf's successor, Falk, and this is the start of the chapter, tried to run a roughshod over monastic rites. He arrives at uh, Fleury, on the feast day of Benedict, a very symbolic day, um, and only leaves when violently opposed. And then at a subsequent synod to discuss this, he and Archbishop Leodric of Saint threatened to burn Gautzelan's exemption privilege, which he of course shows to say, hey, you can't do this. And they threatened to burn it. So clearly there were continuing issues around exemption and the rights Abbo received. But crucially, Andrew, who speaks as an eyewitness here, speaks of the monk's privilege in the singular, decretum, scriptum. And the very fact that they threatened to burn it suggests there's only one and there's this thin textual line that could be uh, eliminated. We also have no hints that the issue of external consecration is at stake here. So why would you interpolate that further if that's not the point of contention? The point of contention is the existing rights to exclude the bishop unless he's invited. That's what they're debating and that's in the original Abbo text. So I'm now inclined to follow the lead of the transmission as I interpret it and place this text in the 1050s or later. It's here that we have the first se secure evidence of the existence of these forgeries in the form of Alexander II's bull, which includes that key clause on external abatial consecration. So it can't take that from the Gregory V text, uh, which otherwise could be the model. This is of course, always a suspicious feature when new rites are in a forgery and then in here you have the wording in his one, when new rites appear in a forgery and then appear in confirmation, it's quite often the case that you're forging something to receive confirmation and to extend your rights. And of course, Connie Bouchard has noted that the mid 11th century was the first great age of forgery of papal privileges in France. And close um, parallels emerge here, of course, not only with Saint Denis, but also Corby, Montier en Dare, Fécamp, um, uh, you name it. It's also in this period that the need for demonstrable tradition of exemption became pronounced. As Falkenstein has shown, this becomes the measuring stick par excellence for exemption. So it becomes understood that those houses that are exempt have always been exempt. 
And that's partly why we get this boom in forgery. Now, the problem here is that Abo's original privilege frames itself largely as a de novo grant. And Imoin accepts this as well and also emphasizes this. This isn't a problem in 997, but it is a problem in 1072. There's no evidence in terms of this, in, uh, in fact, also that Gautzla ever sought confirmation of these rights. Although he brings out the bull and is clearly very proud of it, he goes to Rome, he doesn't ever seemingly solicit one. But of course, William does, and he solicits this one from Alexander II. And to receive this, he almost certainly did need precedent, especially for any new claims regarding abatial consecration. And finally, on this point, it's also the second half of the 11th century that this Cluniac model of external abatial con uh, uh, consecration begins to be copied elsewhere. Um, we have some hints that it might exist earlier in Frutuaria, but um, uh, Stephen van der Putten and Ben Paul have argued very persuasively that the evidence of Fecamp, for example, is actually later. So it's the second half of the 11th century that we see this being um, introduced to places like Fecamp, Marmoutier, um, possibly a little bit early in Frutuaria, but it's the only other possible early case beyond Cluny. So while it's impossible to be categorical, I think a strong case can be made for the Abbacy of William being the time that the forgeries were produced. What they add to the original privilege beyond the right of external consecration is evidence of a tradition of exemption of multiple previous popes having issued this. And indeed the Benedict VII text explicitly refers to those exemplars in a way that neither pseudo Gregory IV nor the authentic Gregory V do. So it becomes a potential linchpin that suggests a long tradition of repeating these kinds of rites. In this respect, certainly they succeed by being copied in the Alexander Bull, as you see here. So what does this tell us about medieval forgery more generally? Well, not surprisingly, that it mirrors power constellations. We see a slow but steady rise of papal authority in these years at a time when kings themselves are often less effective and where certainly at Fleury they're less effective due to the very local dynamics of power and authority that align the kings with episcopal power and not naturally with the interests of the monks. They're also often, as we see here, a reaction to social and political and institutional change. And so here too, what we see is William and his monks adapting to the new world, claiming new rights that are becoming increasingly widespread, but also um, adapting to this new tradition of exemption being a defining feature of these rights. So in this manner, localized problems faced by centers such as uh, Fleury came to have Europe-wide ramifications. Just like internal quarrels within the United Kingdom's conservative party can lead to an entire nation exiting from a hugely successful international union, so squabbles between a bishop and an abbot in the 10th century Loire Valley had the potential to shape how people across much of Europe thought about monasteries and exemption for years to come. It's by this sort of means that exemption gradually came on to take on a more formal guise at Fleury as elsewhere. And so in a very real and literal sense, the monks of Fleury were amongst those who helped forge the central medieval tradition of monastic exemption. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you so much for your paper. I think everyone is admirative, is uh, admiring your skills. I think what you propose here is quite convincing and it shows us that all these forgeries are to be uh, looked and looked again and more and more and deeper and deeper and it's everything is has to be to be to be to be to be to be arrested again and again so it's quite a condensing it's quite interesting and no uh, i'm quite sure that uh, there will be some some questions a lot of questions about your hypothesis and your your I think your point was very strong. Il y a some questions. Est-ce qu'il y a des questions? N'hésitez pas même à les poser en français. On traduira. It's quite still still a, a little difficult to ask the first question. I'll ask one by myself. Did you find other evidences of uh, such? Uh, forgeries attributed uh, to uh, 
uh, mm, changes of, of uh, attributions towards forgeries related to exemptions in the urban century like that it's is it quite common this kind of uh, of very complex set of forgeries around exemptions at the time um, especially uh, related to this kind of very famous dossier yes is the short answer the obvious other case of course that many here will know better than me is saint denis um, but the one that I really enjoyed um, reading about recently was, and I'd highly recommend anyone here who's interested in these things to look up, is Stephen Vanderputten and Ben Paul's mm. article on Faye Camp, where they show, I think, very convincingly that the if you look at the bunching of the text, um, the way it, it was Ben's work on the paleography, but the, the, the text that was thought to be an authentic original, that there's this bunching in the second half. And that if you were to calculate how much space they would have needed without that clause for external co consecration, it would have fit perfectly on the page. And so this is a very good imitative hand mm -hmm. of the second. Now, there were a few other reasons for thinking that as well, but they very persuasively, I think, argue, because previously it was thought that this Cluniac model is em emulated earlier already in the first half of the 11th century. But I thought they were very convincing on Fécamp being second half of the 11th century. And so it becomes a very nice, uh, counterpoint. Um, and we see similar efforts, particularly um, uh, around exemption, less, we have some in Germany, but less so. Um, but some of the great English standoffs, so a place like St. Albans and things like that, um, uh, Westminster in the 11th, 12th centuries as well. But uh, the early evidence and the best early evidence is um, uh, from France. It, that, that's where you seem to be seeing it. And it fits nicely with Christoph Rolker's arguments that the collection in 74 titles should be viewed in a North French monastic milieu, which of course is preserved yeah. in the Saint-Denis dossier. It can't be Saint-Denis because textually it's corrupt in that form. So he's pretty convincing that it isn't produced at Saint-Denis, but North French monastic, he likes to think Rams, that's quite possible. Interestingly, it's the only canon law collection so influenced from Abbo's canonical works. Oh, yeah. So there's a direct connection that they know, a North French monastic audience, and it's a further argument because it used to be thought by Gilchrist and others that that was a papal reform text. Um, and he points out that the reforming is not particularly papal, but it, it speaks more to monastic interests. And the fact that they know Abbo, it would be very weird given the very narrow transmission of Abbo's canonical works for someone in Rome or Italy to know Abbo's works. But for someone in a Northern French monastic milieu would make perfect sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very interesting. But other questions? Everyone was so convinced. Nobody dares to. Um, might I? Sorry. Yes. Bastien, oui? Um, thank you for this uh, amazing uh, presentation. I just got one question. Um, I'm currently studying hagiographic texts from the Abbey of Saint Maximin in Trier, but hagiographic texts from the 16th century. And the Abbey of Saint Maximin was uh, a huge center of for forgeries in the 11th century that have been studied by Theo Kölzer. And we clearly see in the 16th century that the monks reused these forgeries um, to rewrite hagiographic texts, but they also compiled some legendaries, so hagiographic manuscripts combining the new hagiographic text, the old hagiographic text and the diplomatic forgeries. So I wonder if there are some similar things for the Abbey of Fleury um, for, for the later uh, centuries where the forgeries are reused in that way, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> thank, you. I, I, thank you for the question. It's a great one. I must admit to a degree of ignorance um, in terms of one of the difficulties I've had with this project is I've redated the charters but everyone I've asked what's going on at Fleury after about the 1040s say the sources run dry. So in a sense, this now gives us some more sources there, but it, it gets much patchier. And I must admit in the early modern period, I don't know what's going on at Fleury, um, though I suspect our ability to know precisely will be would be hindered by the destruction of the abbatial archives and some of the problems in transmission there. Um, but it is a good question because it enters their historiography early because Imoin cites that charter. And also he makes it clear. So the charter just of course says the Bishop cannot enter, but he says this is the charter states that Bishop Arnulf cannot enter. So he provides the nice gloss and he doesn't 
talk about all of the rights and he particularly picks out from the charter when he summarizes it, those that relate to the bishop and speaks of it as Arnulf. So he, you know, we would have deduced it anyway, but he gives a nice view of what it really means between the lines that this is all with the local bishop involved. But it may well be that others here know better than I. I'm, I'm not an expert in the central or later Middle Ages and certainly not of uh, Fleury there. But as you say, it's the sort of food for thought that mm -hmm. could easily percolate um, further. And of course, Saint Maxima, in fact, one of my other collections, there's an interesting connection there. The earliest forgeries there could be around the year 1000, or maybe even the 950s if Coltzer is wrong. But uh, Anno of Worms um, produces a massive set of Worms forgeries, and he's trained at Saint Maxima. Okay. Um, so we, we have some interesting uh, examples of this spreading through different uh, centers. Thank you. All right, other questions? Just uh, following the, the ID, if anyone has any question, just, just uh, open your, your, your camera and, and tell. Uh, but I have a question for, for you, Levi. Uh, more generally uh, speaking, and uh, following the ID uh, uh, proposed by, by Bastien uh, and, and what you have just said, uh, do you think that there are some kind of, uh, following your uh, experience, following all the, the studies you have done uh, about 10th and 11th century, are there some kind of communities of forgers? Do you, uh, do you, do you think that there are specific, uh, uh, specific connections between forgers? You, you mentioned here uh, Anno and, and, uh, and Trier and so on and so on. I don't know. What do you think about that? I think it's quite possible and likely. So in some cases we can trace it. So um, it's quite possible, particularly if Coltzer's wrong, which is always a dangerous thing to bet against. But there, there's reason to think on some Maxima he might be. I need to revisit the paleography. But his argument for saying the earliest forgeries there around the year 1000 are purely paleographical. And it requires a very awkward reading of Regino, the continuator of Regino of Prum's Chronicle, uh, a very tortuous reading of it. Um, if there's forgery there in the 950s. It's around the same time that Anno, who's trained there, is forging, and later Magdeburg becomes a major center, and Magdeburg is founded out of mm -hmm. San Maxima. And in fact, the person who um, has been identified there as um, the likely forger by Hushner is of the same school as the person forging uh, as Hildebald B in Worms. Um, we don't know the uh, master-student relationship. If Hushner's right, we might have to invert it. But in any case, they're part of the same school. So that's a nice example. Because we don't have the originals and we don't have much in the way of originals or pseudo originals for Fleury, it becomes hard. But it is striking that Misi is forging not papal documents, but royal diplomas in the second half of the 11th century, also yeah. claiming um, uh, uh, liberty and immunity. Um, so they're forging uh, Carolingian and early Capetian documents mm -hmm. uh, there. And those have been discussed by Brühl and Kutzer uh, mm -hmm. in the most detail. So I certainly think that's an interesting one, given how close they are in some of those kinds of connections. Um, but of course, you have these wider networks as well that I suspect are starting to um, uh, work together in terms of these monks at these kinds of big gatherings. So we've got Corby getting things going as well. And some of these big with, particularly with the popes and synods becoming more, much more active. That becomes a kind of place for transmission of ideas that's harder to pin down. Um, so I think sometimes we can trace genealogies, but not always. Um, uh, and sometimes we can trace forgery and counter forgery on different sides. Um, uh, so I think sometimes you can see it percolate, but my rule of thumb would be that there is, I think by the late 10th century, and one of the arguments of the book is that it's the first period we see forgery across the core areas of Western Europe, and that it is just about everywhere, in fact. So mm -hmm. um, uh, some of it, I think, is organic responses to new attitudes to law, new social configurations. So uh, we were talk I was talking about here exemption changing, immunity is changing and territorializing. Mm -hmm. And we also see lots of those forgeries. Anno's Worms forgeries are all about immunity. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Uh, st still no other questions. Hmm? Anyone willing to tell me my paleography is wrong? Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, that's a bit I'm worried about, particularly now that I've signed off on the book, but... Yes, I, I'm not a specialist in paleography, so I can't tell. I can't. But maybe here and there, I know, I'm sure that there are people uh, 
willing to speak about it. No? Nobody? Nobody dares? No, I think it's it's too strong. You're too, you you <laughs> made your point. Uh, just uh, uh, what what are uh, you know very well all this uh, this very complex diplomatic landscape around papacy and uh, and and these relations, very complex relations. Do, do you do uh, have you noticed some kind of uh, reactions of specific reactions in? Uh, specific behaviors in uh, the uh, papal diplomatics uh, around all this uh, this uh, trend of uh, for for uh, uh, confirmations. Uh, do you, do you do you notice some some modifications of behavior related to that and perhaps. Uh, showing that they are quite aware that the documents which are presented to them could be forgeries. I don't know if I'm quite clear. Yes, you are. It's one of the things I wonder about. So in some of the regions I've studied, we do get clear evidence of increasing cynicism, which is what you'd expect. That uh -huh. A bit like um, some of you will know Tony Grafton's work on the early modern period in forgery and that forgery and criticism go hand in hand. And I think they must do to some extent, mm -hmm. some of the time. Um, but we can't always see it. And they're also combining, though, with new attitudes that are often anachronistic ones. So um, one of the things I think Falkenstein's very good on is how exemption becomes this idea that exempt houses have always been exempt. And everyone's convinced of this. So they expect there should be these earlier privileges. Mm -hmm. So the, the popes are expecting it as well as the monasteries. And so in a sense, they're filling in the gaps in a way that will conform to the biases of a papal audience who expect this and expect that popes should have been granting these rights from day one when of course they often weren't. And when we do look at them, I mean, I was very careful there. Rennie uses the term exemption generally and very generously, which is quite useful in some respects, but it means that he talks about the early Fleury texts as exemptions. These are popes saying, uh, I'm guaranteeing your landed integrity and that nobody should interfere with your lands. They're not much more than that. And sometimes mentioning the right of free abatial election, they say nothing about relations with the Episcopal Bishop or anything that, you know, you or probably I would normally think of as exemption. Um, and I think there has been this kind of watershed moment that's hard for them to go uh, back across. So it's this weird combination between anachronism, but often also historical sophistication because they're basing these on early texts. They're adjusting their formulation. Where we have their script, they're sometimes adjusting their script as well. Um, the other thing that I don't discuss in detail in the book and didn't discuss here, but that I wonder about too is what these texts would have looked like as the forgeries. Mm -hmm. Because in Abbo's day, at least, most papal privileges are still papyrus. But by Alexander II's day, they're not. Um, but of course, because papyrus deteriorates so fast, I think there's a lot less um, wariness around documents that are only copial if they're papal privileges. That's certainly my impression is that, and Marco Moster has written about how quickly people make copies because they know that the papyrus will deteriorate. Yes. So it's quite, it's a lot easier to explain a way why you don't have them. Though of course at Saint Denis they do and where you do have it, you work with it. But of course, you know, I, I suspect whoever forged these couldn't have produced a good pseudo original, certainly not of the correct date because they wouldn't have had papyrus and they wouldn't have been able to write the curial script mm -hmm. uh, in terms of that, but they may well not have tried. Uh, and particularly if it's part of a dossier we don't know in 1072 if they still even have Abbo's one in the original, but if it's part of a dossier, they're reinforcing each other. And um, given that their purpose is probably partly to create this tradition, I suspect that's not uh, a fatal flaw for them. But there are hints. I mean, the classic one from the later 10th century already is the diploma of Otto III, where they seem to doubt the donation of Constantine. And some people have sort of tried to interpret it that as it's just doubting the version they're shown, but I don't actually have a problem with them necessarily doubting the donation of Constantine. They, they, there are lots of forged charters in Italy in that period. Um, uh, and anything that goes beyond what they might have thought a correct emperor would have issued, I could see them doubting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Oh, very nice. All right. So, do we have anyone who wants to? Ah, Clemens. Clemens Hall. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for this um, fascinating talk. Um, what I was want to go back to is the um, canon law question. Mm 
you mentioned at the beginning briefly that um, Abo did um, make a canon law collection himself. And I think as far as I know, in this collection, he also incorporated two letters by Gregory the first um, about a specific case of monastic, yeah? Five, but yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, but um, okay, what five. I'm going to is uh, yeah. um, that two of those letters were later on in the collection of 74 titles. I think they were used and combined into a famous forgery which made its round in the 11th century. And I, I think that these, um, this forged Gregory, the first letter, pseudo Gregory, made its way back into some cartularies in the 11th and maybe even 12th centuries. So did any of this material, either from Abbo's own collection or from this collection in 74 titles or from any of these circulating forged um, Gregory decretals make its way back into some Fleury material? So in any of those, later forgeries you mentioned or in the cartulary of Fleury, did it ever surface again there or is it something which only happened for other monasteries? Thank you, excellent question, excellent points. Um, but you've hit the nail on the head with the problem there, the cartulary of Fleury. We don't have a cartulary of Fleury of, uh, of comprehensive. So we're dependent upon the cartularies of the priories. It's like La Réole is one of our, La, the La Réole cartulary I showed you, the early modern copy of the medieval La Réole cartulary is our only point of transmission for the Benedict the Seventh bull, for example. We have some others for Gregory the Fourth, but those ones again don't really take us back to Fleury materials. So I think that one, I'd have to double check, but I'm pretty sure that's a known unknown in Donald Rumsfeld's terms. But you're quite right; that's absolutely key to what's going on here. So there's those two letters. Um, Abo quotes five in his well, two in his Canon Law collection, five in his letter seven, um, in his letter fourteen which is his mm -hmm. other canon law collection. Uh, and those five are also all quoted by Imoin. And he's quoting them, he's, I'm, he says, I'm quoting Gregory to show that the Pope didn't do anything against canon law and against tradition, because he's aware of the novelty, he's trying to hide it. He's aware that that's an issue um, mm -hmm. in some senses already. But you're quite right, that's an essential part of the story and it's happening in parallel. Fleury is a possible place even for that forgery. It's, I, be surprised if they didn't know of that forged text in that version and it wasn't circulating there. Um, the person who's recently discussed this is Rennie, a little in his book, but mostly in an article in the Savini Stiftung for uh, yeah. in the Kanonische Abteilung. Yeah. He discusses there uh, how that comes into existence and circulates. Um, and it's speaking to exactly these same kinds of needs. And it's something that I wasn't talking about here, but one of the things that Abbo's authentic bull cites time and again is Gregory the Great. He's his favorite authority in this canon law collections, in his privileges, because he's one of those early popes who's a bit vague on these issues, but at least addresses them and does tell bishops to stand back, not as clearly as they'd like, which is why they then forge it, but he provides the, the stepping stones um, for this. So yeah, it's happening very closely in tandem with canon law collections, and I defer to Christoph on the 74 titles in terms of origin, but I'm sure he'd be the first to say that you couldn't exclude, in fact, Fleury as an origin for it, given that it knows Abbo's materials. And it's almost certainly the sort of thing that monks of Fleury would have known in that kind of context. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Another one. Nobody wants to intervene. Hello. Ah, Jean-François. Hello. Um, I have a stupid question, as always. Uh, how, how difficult, actually, was it to forge a 10th century original papal document? Uh, when you're looking at 12th or 13th century papal documents, uh, they are extremely well executed uh, documents extremely standardized, standardized documents, and uh, which are indeed, I would say, nearly impossible to forge when you are not a notary of the Papal Chancery. Uh, how far is it the case for, I, I don't know, uh, well, 10th or 11th century Papal documents, uh, how far was it difficult to imitate uh, a document from this period? The short answer is in a way that would fool us very hard. In a way that might have fooled them, it's harder to know because they're still being produced on papyrus. 
um, and papyrus, it's they already know that this deteriorates quite quickly. So there, you would probably use it as, as an excuse. You'd produce something on parchment, claim it was a copy of a lost document. Whether or not that would have worked is much harder to know. But to do it accurately, I mean, Saint-Denis is they're the best ones at it because they have papyrus. But the fact that they have it just emphasizes how little papyrus anyone else has. Um, because I don't know of pseudo original papal forgeries in the late 10th century, early 11th century. By the later 11th century, you start seeing them more as it moves on to parchment. But certainly to forge for these documents that are produced at Fleury to be completely persuasive to by a modern standard, they'd not only need to have a papal bull on them, they would need to be in papyrus and they need to be in curial script. Curial script is dropping off by the end of, uh, by the 11th century, but it's going strong still in the 10th, early 11th. Um, and we know that that creates all sorts of problems, not um, just, you know, for those trying to copy it or imitate it, but even for those trying to read it. So there's a famous mm -hmm. case that uh, already Mabillon discussed um, in, um, uh, uh, in Tours where the archbishop asks, the local abbot in the letter says, he asks him to read this document for him, the abbot of Marmoutier, because he cannot read, read the Romana Litera there, that he, he cannot read these Roman letters. So there's this kind of awareness that this is in a fancy script that is associated with Rome, um, but that they're not able to read it, let alone, if presumably they cannot read it very well, let alone write it. So, um, I would say in terms of that, to reach our levels of, uh, to fool a modern scholar, it would be almost impossible. But precisely because of that, they may have been more open to manipulation in the Middle Ages because of uh, the lacuna, the issues around transmission and because contemporaries were aware of it. Um, uh, the other issue you have, of course, is I think often, particularly with these early papal forgeries, they're forging a papal document, but either in conformity with what popes expect or also often more with the local audience in mind anyway. And so if you're forging it not to show to the Pope, it doesn't matter so much. What matters is what does the person you're gonna to show to it know about a papal document? And that's a different, entirely different issue in terms of how persuasive. Thank you, Rhett. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Francois. Other, other reactions, other questions I think we have? come to an end to our little meeting. Uh, quite nice conversation. And uh, most of all, we had uh, a wonderful talk, a very convincing, brilliant talk by Levi Roach. It was a pleasure to have you among us today. And I hope we will be able to meet very soon live and in person, able to uh, to exchange and probably to have a drink to discuss about forgeries in a few in a few months. I don't know where, I don't know when, but we'll hope that will be happen very soon. And uh, anyway, uh, thank you for everyone for your attendance. Uh, donc, uh, n'oubliez pas que la, de le 7 décembre, nous avons uh, une autre... Uh, uh, une autre conférence, une autre, une autre, une autre intervention de Zina, de Zina Cohen, qui est donc est à la PHE uh, et qui va nous parler d'une partie de sa thèse, expose d'un extrait de sa thèse uh, autour de la contribution de l'analyse des matériaux d'écriture à la connaissance des documents légaux, le cas de la communauté médiévale juive du Caire. C'est une experte en matière. Euh, de, donc justement d'expertise, euh, d'analyse de, de l'écriture et des matériaux d'écriture en tant que tel. Elle va travailler notamment à partir de la Guinisa, des matériaux de la Guinisa. Donc euh, j'espère vous voir nombreux aussi le 7 décembre euh, à, à 17h. Hein, je vous mets le, euh, le, comment dire, le, le programme euh, directement en... Euh, donc, je vous envoie à, à tous, voilà, par le chat. Voilà, j'espère que vous allez pouvoir le recevoir, sinon vous pouvez le voir assez facilement euh, via euh, le programme du, euh, du, du séminaire, du webinaire. Anyway, euh, merci à tous, thank you so much to Levi Roach. Euh, 
for his wonderful talk. Uh, donc, merci encore pour votre, uh, votre venue et j'espère que uh, vous allez bien. Faites attention à vous. On se revoit bien vite. Thank you again, Levi. Merci beaucoup. Thanks for having me. À bientôt à tout le monde.